wonderful to see your show here. I mean, I haven't actually seen it in person, but Stephen has kindly sent me the documents. And so I've had a quick browse through, which is terrific. The show looks elegant and uh, beautifully hung. Yeah, I think it's uh, conceptually very smart and, and, and um, consistent show. So it looks, I'd, li I'd like to see it actually, but I, perhaps I don't need to because I've got all the documents now. So that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once we, um, we're, we're, we'll have a downloadable PDF catalog as soon as the folks in China are able to um, get everything rolling again. All uh -huh. of our production there was um, interrupted, but then everybody will be able to just download the whole, the whole yeah. show. Well, that's a nice concept. I uh, like that. And in fact, we'll also even use some of the installation shots. The great thing about the delay, so the pandemic has not been entirely bad with relation to the show. The great thing about the delay is that now we'll be able to include the installation shots from the atom. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And I get this is the first, this is actually the first installation of the show. Is that correct? We had, we had a soft opening in Shanghai um, in October. Uh -huh. And this is because now, because this one was designed by the Adams designer, it, you can say it's the second soft opening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But um, this is the first installation that looks the way it should look. Because in Shanghai, we had a very odd situation. They, uh, they found us a very beautiful exhibition space down by the river. Not, not the big Shanghai River, but one of the other rivers. O although it could be part of the big river that I, I'm still a little, the city is so big, I'm always confused. Mm. And um, the walls were all glass. So it turned out that instead of exhibiting it on the walls, the way we've done at the Atom, this was the, the almost the pre-soft opening. They had to design a special exhibition table and all the pieces were placed under glass and you could walk around the table looking down to read them. Uh-huh, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Big, big sheet of glass, not, not, not yeah. frames. Yes, yes. And does it exist as a, a book also, as a? It will when the, when the catalog is ready. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because that's... the catalog will have a page for every one of the event scores. Cool. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's nice. I really liked the, um, I, was, I was browsing through some of the really early ones. I, I love the postcard piece. Ah. Like sending a postcard every day and gradually you create a message that somebody receives. <laughs> it's such a nice idea. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you were, you were involved generously in, in Earthworks. I, I, I presume you, I mean, I've got some early photos of you here, which I don't know whether you recall. Yeah. Some. <laughs> 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 photos that you sent uh, that became part of the documentation, you know? Yeah. It was nice to, um, Nice to revisit this recently. There was a, an exhibition called Groundswell that was uh, mounted at Auckland Art Gallery that uh, revisited a lot of conceptual art from the and post object art from the from the seventies, seventies, eighties. Yeah. So this this piece had a had a, um, a had an opportunity to be restaged, which was nice. Yeah. Your practice with the um, the conceptual uh, Fluxus works. I mean, that's gone, that dates right back to, I gather, from when you were what, six or seven years old, you wrote your, yeah. first, your first little poetic well, kind of I, conceptual I, piece. I did it, but I didn't write them until I met George Machunas. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's when I started writing them. Uh, he explained, you know, you've got to write these down. Yeah, you, yeah. Can't just, you can't just. <laughs> do them and watch them flutter off into the air. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And in fact, it's interesting because even the ones before I started to write them down, I often repeated them, I told people about them, so they were done more than once. 
but they just weren't written as scores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Altogether, it's difficult to say, but I think altogether there's probably about six or 700 of them. There's a, a, a fellow at the University of Iowa who is making a, a complete collection with, uh, with variant versions and everything. So I'll get a chance to look at them all um, <laughs> probably by the end of the year. Right. <laughs> Very good. It'd be nice to have all the total, all the titles of the uh, seven, how many hundred? How many hundred? Seven hundred? Six, Six or seven hundred, maybe. Yeah. Have all the, all the titles on your tombstone. I think as a, as a, <laughs> as a finale. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, though. I, I, I actually, on my tombstone, I'm just going to have a name, no dates even. Just, that's it. Your work has a nice, uh, a wry sense of humor to it. And I, I wonder, I mean, I presume you, you have a lot of fun writing those pieces, clearly. And uh, how much is the playful aspect of it uh, important to you? Well, it, it depends on the piece. Um, you know, a lot of the works arise from an idea or a moment or a... a response to something. Mm. So it, it really depends on the piece. But you can say that I think that an enormous lot of contemporary art, including conceptual art, takes itself too seriously. But I've mm. also got to say that in some cases, there's a lot of artworks and artists who don't take themselves seriously enough. Um, you need a balance between play and other qualities. And it depends on the, on the idea you're working with or with the context or the moment. Mm. To what extent would you, might you have been influenced by Asian thinking you know, with the kind of more oh, like, immensely Taoist or Taoist you, kind of philosophy? Buddhist, Zen, Buddhist, yeah. in, in great part. Mm. Um, if I would say, um, in an odd way, I mean, I hope it does. It, it it it's probably making too much out of it, but in an odd way, uh, one of the people that I looked to as a kind of role model was the sixth-century Chinese hermit monk Han Shan, uh, because he 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 would write these marvelous little poems and then leave them on, on trees or rocks or, or the walls of monasteries. Mm, wow. And yeah, they, no. were, they were gathered up and collected after he died. I've got about, I've got about 10 different translations of his work. The, the best translation oh. Oh. overall was a wonderful little booklet that um, Gary Snyder published mm -hmm. called Cold Mountain Poems. And he only, he only translated about... 16 or 17 of them, but they're, they're just wonderful. Mm. But then again, the big collected works, there's translations of maybe 300 of them. Mm. Mm. I got to have to check that out. I was just wondering maybe um, if you could go back to the, uh, the Earthworks um, project and um, talk about how you both initially made contact and how, how, did you, um, how did you come in contact with each other and um, develop that piece, Phil? Oh, um, I, was, I was hunting around trying to find uh, connections that would actually give me the, uh, the range of latitude, altitude, longitude, and all sort of associations for, around the planet and um, made connection with, I think it came through, um, through my kind of scratch orchestra connections in London. Uh, somebody mentioned 
to me that you know Ken was operating the uh, Flaxus West in, in California. And so I was, I was hunted out an address and I think I just uh, wrote to Ken and asked if he might consider participating and um, it kind of took off from there. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was, <laughs> I, I actually sent out, I think, uh, 15, 15 different um, sets of instructions with, you know, a roll of, a roll of film and a roll of uh, cassette tape at the time. Those little mini mini cassette <laughs> reels, you know. It all, all feels very, um, very anachronistic and kind of analog now. <laughs> but <laughs> it's um, it was extremely exciting to me because I, I had a, I had a history of pen friends and kind of writing to people in different parts of the world from when I was just a little kid. So I had that fascination with kind of global connections, you know. And that work for me was a, a real life changer, yeah. To actually get it realized and bring things into one place <laughs> in terms of the results. So yeah, no, I really appreciated uh, Ken's enthusiasm to participate. I'm kind of curious about um, those early days of setting up Fluxus West and how, um, uh, how was the relationship with New York and, and Machunas and others and how, how encouraging were they of decentralizing this Fluxus movement? Oh, well, George was, was very, very much um, in favor of it. Uh, the way it happened, I, I went to New York and Dick Higgins introduced me to George and George enrolled me in Fluxus and I was living there in New York for a while. Then I decided to move back to California and George said, well, you should do Fluxus stuff there. So I decided to actually open a center and I took it very seriously for a long time. People were generous and helpful. There was a lot of communication. The rest of the art world didn't really care much for us. Um, and in fact, what, what's very much interesting is that um, if, if I would say there was, there was a lot of, an enormous amount of activity that simply vanished. Uh, I mean, if you go to a few archives, places like the University of Iowa or the Modern or the Tate, you can, you can reconstruct a lot of it. Uh, historians can reconstruct it, but there was a long period when I, it suddenly occurred to me recently that all of this talk about daily life, well, if John Cage does daily life or hunts mushrooms or makes an omelet, that's art. And if Alison Knowles makes a salad and does it in the Tate, that's art. But if you go to a, a park somewhere that's not part of the norm normative world and you reframe a daily activity and simply perform it, if it hasn't been framed by an art institution, nobody cares. It's not even that it's not art, nobody cares. And I realized then that, I won't say I realized then because I didn't think about it then. Then uh, there was simply this, um, I could say Han Shan like, you know, wandering around in the world and doing these things. And I thought it was interesting and in some way significant. Um, doing enormous numbers of Fluxus concerts, performing everybody's work. Uh, and I realized later that um, <laughs> to, to most of those guys, a lot of them were really just focused on being artists within the normative art world. That's not the case for Machunas, it's not the case for Higgins, but it was the case for a lot of the others. Mm -hmm. So was almost irrelevant to them. Um, and this also leads me to, to question a lot of what happened in those days. Um, it interested me because of its liberatory power, its 
power of conceptual reframing, its power of engaging with ways to think and do and be. But I, I suspect sometimes that only a few of us, like Dick and George and I, really had those kinds of interests. Dick was especially, um, but he was a bit lonely even when he was living in New York because he would be thinking about these things and people would be grumbling about his essays and what they wanted him to do with something else press was whoever it was, whatever it was, Dick should be publishing a book about them with pictures of their work. Many, many times over the years, people have asked me if Fluxus died or when did Fluxus die? And and um, the other day I realized for me when it was, was when I opened the newspaper and I saw that Cristo was dead because he was, you can say the last of a kind of generation of people who did things his own, own way, but always in a, in, a, in a friendly, generous manner, always with perfect integrity. And he brought, he brought a world into being in, in, in a perfect way. Mm. So it's, for it's me, when- Higgins, did you say? Cristo. Oh, sorry. Cristo. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cristo, he was, he was a little bit part of Fluxus, um, mm. did a few things with Fluxus at the very beginning. Right. Um, mm. But he really went his own way as himself all the time. Uh, we, were, we were close personal friends. And when I lived in New York, we used to see each other an awful lot. But um, I just mean that for me, he, and I could say in an interesting way, Carolee Schneemann, Namjoon Paik, a few others, represented the most elegant and perfect realization of Fluxus, but he was the last. <laughs> what about George Britt? When did what? George Britt. George Brecht. Hmm. Well, George is very important, but geez, he's been gone for ages. He's been gone a long time, yeah. But he had a he had a he had a good very good presence, didn't he? And I mean, I had some connection with that in in London in the late '60s, because he was a good friend of Cornelius Cardew's and came through London regularly and often participated in the in the Scratch Orchestra events. So Scratch oh, Orchestra yeah, but had George Fleck Fluxus kind of uh, influence. George withdrew from the world really already in the 1980s, the early 1980s. If you wanted to talk to George even, you had to send him a postcard. That's right. And postcard man. <laughs> if, if he wanted to talk to you, you you'd, you'd write him a letter. You'd tell him when you were going to call. And if he wanted to talk to you, he'd plug the phone in and answer. <laughs> um, I wonder, Phil, if you could talk a little bit about how... Um... I mean, in some ways, I think of your role in setting up the intermediate department and sustaining a lot of interest in, I guess, things that connect to fluxus-based activities, live performance, um, conceptualist pieces, time-based media, video, and so forth. And um, uh, in some ways, I think um, uh, those activities sort of got extended over that whole period that... Um, we were just talking about um, due to that hub around the, that little art school in central Auckland. And I'm, um, I'm just curious about, um, yeah, how, how you thought of those, those activities um, over that period and, um, and what, how hard was it to sustain interest in, in what you were doing over that time? Mm. Uh... I guess, I, um, I mean, I, I've, I've always had a, a, a much more kind of a broader kind of transdisciplinary sort of interest anyway. So um, flux, fluxus thinking has definitely been a, 
um, an influence, strong influence, but for my own personal um, practice, it's kind of, I guess it's, it's kind of spread across different media according to what the concept demanded. So, um, and I was very keen to uh, create a situation that where borders dissolved really, um, where students had access to a lot of different media and could explore, explore ideas freely through a range of media. So um, in association with that, I, you know, I taught a consistent program of Fluxus, Dada, Futurist History. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm very disappointed these days to find so little, little of that kind of taught or known by students. Um, there's a lot of uh, repetition going on of ideas that are just, you know, seem so um, familiar from the, from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that are kind of re, re, revisiting, but without the, the kind of historical understanding or kind of uh, information. Um, but that said, I just got, it was contacted just uh, yesterday, actually, by um, a lecturer, Alan Brown, who's a um, very good contemporary musician, who teaches at the SAE Institute in Auckland. And he's uh, started a, a new program. Uh, he's calling it the Anarchist Futurist um, uh, program <laughs> based around Fluxus, uh, a lot of Fluxus thinking. <laughs> So, um, and setting projects for students to come up with, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, initiatives that are very kind of left center. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful he comes up with something that's uh, really interesting. I've offered, offered a lot of my resources to him. I'm, I'm, I'm in a process at the moment of downsizing and, and getting rid of a lot of stuff. So it's nice to be able to hand things on. I'm very happy to be able to pass that material on. I guess a serendipitous connection uh, that I was thinking of about earlier was the way in which Earthworks is trying to happen simultaneously across multiple venues and the ways mm -hmm. in which um, this events exhibition seems to be devised in such a way that it can be printed without any single location at all. It can be shown in multiple locations across the world uh, the prints are readily available and easily produced and cheaply produced. And um, I mean, I'm just wondering if you could talk, or either of you could talk about this idea of the simultaneity and, and how that manifested in each of your works. Mm. Mm. After you, Ken. <laughs> oh, well, I, what I can say is, in theory, almost any Fluxus work or at least a lot of it, because of course, some works are very specific and local and site specific, but many, many Fluxus works, anything based on the scores can in theory be anywhere, everywhere, all the time. Uh, but that's not necessarily simultaneity because it really depends on whoever wants to realize it. Every now and then you get these wonderful pieces like Mia Koshiomi's spatial poem works that often really were simultaneous. For example, asking everyone in the world to let her know what they were doing at one moment um, or something. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what I can say is playing with time as a distinct element of artworks was very much a, a central fluxus concern. Um, but that m might involve the simultaneous, or it could be all sorts of other ways of playing with, with the dimension of time. Mm -hmm. For example, um, there's a postcard piece. I don't think it's in the show, but um, Phil was mentioning this one where do you send a message as, as postcards? Um, th there's another one where, where I would go on a trip and every day I would send a postcard from wherever I was and that would show map out the, the time and the space together. 
or there's another postcard piece where somebody sneezes and you make a note of the time and a year later you send them a postcard that says Gesundheit. So it's, it's sort of conscious, conscious play with the aspect of time. Um, what was very much a part of it. Mm. Mm. Do you want to talk any more about that, Phil? Mm. <laughs> uh, well, I think just the focus on, on uh, in a way, it seems to me a very flexus thing to kind of focus around the ephemeral. Um, things that are fleeting, that, uh, that kind of fly in and out like, uh, you know, like, like a butterfly of ideas or something. And it's, um, I think that fascination for me was reflected in a piece that was subsequent to Earthworks, which was the ART piece, the amateur radio transmission, where you had half a dozen um, ham radio stations uh, operating and bringing in the, bringing the world all into one place. Um, we had an opportunity to do that again recently, but uh, totally digital with um, using website radio. And it was, uh, it was fantastic. It was cool. Really nice. But those, yeah, those moments are they're wonderful because they, they are, um, they're poignant, but there's nothing permanent. And I, I, I do love that aspect. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the beauty of the, uh, the conceptual text pieces is that you, the individual is left to imagine or to um, realize the notions or the concepts in their own time, at their own space, um, in their own way. And it becomes very personal, become very personal uh, response to something it's essentially kind of uh, a, a poetic and, um, you know, very idea-based action. I, I have one last question, actually, about your, um, your piece you called Earthwork in 1971. Where you yeah. uh, proposed owning a parcel of land, uh, uh, a, small, a small parcel of land. <laughs> have you ever realised that piece? No always wanted to there are still a few pieces i i haven't done i don't know maybe if i if i think about it maybe we could arrange to 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 do it in in wellington or auckland or something and in fact you don't even need to own the land on the top it's it's a, it's a cubic foot of earth and I think it's six feet down or something like that. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> six feet under. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm curious about the stance that Flaxus took and a lot of artists of your generation um, where it, it, it not only avoided or, or, or be a market, but it seemed to kind of run counter to it and try to disrupt it. So you... Ken will deliberately um, make endless editions of prints of your works and give them away freely. And um, I'm just sort of curious about um, uh, many years later when artists have such as say Tino Segal and others have famously um, allowed his works to be acquisitioned into collections with spoken instructions without any tangible material thing being transacted. Uh, I'm kind of curious about whether um, uh, how you feel about that, like the likes of Tina Segal in this, the, the value of an idea literally being um, exchanged as opposed to an object. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's an interesting question. What I can say is that I find Tina Segal fascinating because I think he's, um, he's an interesting and serious guy. Um, for myself, I struggled with this whole idea of markets and how to do things or make a living. I'll send you 
I'll send you a digital copy of a book I wrote ah, years ago. It's called The Aesthetics. And in it, there's, there's a few chapters where I really discuss how can you make a living from this stuff? What should the economics of art be? And ultimately, what, what came of it for me was at one point, I was, when Dick Higgins was in California, at California Institute of the Arts, there was this era when, at the beginning, when a lot of Fluxus people were there. Dick, Allison Knowles, Namjoon Paik, Emmett Williams. Everybody was in Los Angeles teaching at Cal Arts. And then there was a huge earthquake, the San Fernando Valley earthquake in 71, I think it was. Um, and Dick decided to go home or go back east. And he decided to go home to live in Vermont at that time. And so he, he closed up operations in California. And I decided to go back to school and finish, finish my degrees. I had, I had been, I, I, I had this very bad habit of dropping in and dropping out of college <laughs> kind of unpredictably way back then. And Dick gave me one good piece of advice, which is probably the best piece of advice I ever got. He said, oh, whatever you do, don't get any art degrees. They're useless. Uh, get a degree in something that you can make a living at. And I didn't exactly plan it that way, but in fact, I wound up taking the advice. And I got a doctorate in behavioral science. And after I got the degree, I still was dropping in and out of the art world and trying to make a living as an artist. But when I got to uh, Norway, due to an odd series of circumstances, I was offered a job where I could use my degree and I became a professor. And the reason Dick told me to not get an art degree is, says, look, you don't wanna to have to depend on the art world for a living. You don't have to depend on teaching art for a living. All of it's unpredictable. Get a degree where you can actually do something interesting and useful and support yourself so that your art is free. And uh, that's what I did. Now, the odd thing is, I have to say, very much like all those things that didn't happen, that if they happen in museums, they're art. And if they didn't happen in museums, they don't exist. And when I say happen in museums, they're art. Uh, I'm even talking about, you know, if you make an omelet in your kitchen, it's an omelet. If you make an omelet in a museum, it's everyday life that's really art, but it's everyday life because it's really art, because, because, because. And it sets up this endless cycle of uh, conversation. Well, what I found in some odd way uh, was that I was very good at the stuff that I, I worked with. Uh, for a while, I was a university dean, and I was doing all these things. But what I didn't count on was the fact <laughs> that they take up an enormous amount of brain power and processing time. So I didn't have to worry about art to make a living. But on the other hand, the art kind of receded. Um, when I come back to think about it, in a way, I don't sell stuff because it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> don't need to. Um, I didn't really plan on it, <laughs> almost without planning to. Um, I became reasonably wealthy. And um, so I, I can do whatever I wish with my time. But as a result of that, then the, the art is still free. Now, um, it's an interesting question. If somebody would come to me, Tina Seagal style, and offer to buy one of my events, and own it with all the rights attending it. And they offered me, let's say a million bucks, would I sell it to them? Well, the truth is, if somebody offered me a million bucks, I would probably sell them it with all the rights because I got 600 of them and <laughs> you never say no to a million bucks. But the, the thing that I, I found so unbelievably 
or, or very believably admirable about Christo and Jean-Claude was that they did everything their way and they supported it their way. I, I remember, for example, Christo always said, he and Jean-Claude always said that they were the only sponsors of their projects. They sold art to raise the money so that they could afford to be the only sponsors. When they were building surrounded islands in Miami, American Express came to them and they were desperate at the time because the project was gonna cost 12 million bucks. They only had about 2 million on hand. And they, they were really working day and night to try and raise the money. And American Express came to them and offered to sponsor the project. And they laughed and said, you, you don't understand how much these things cost. This is gonna cost like 12 million bucks. And the guys at American Express shrugged and said, sure, we'll do that. And then the Christos actually had to explain, thank you, we deeply appreciate the offer, but we never have sponsors. We are the only sponsors of our work. And that really, um, that really meant something to me. Um, I was living in New York at the time. So of course I was, oh, I was always watching a lot of interesting stuff moving back and forth around them. And the, to me, this was an enormous statement an enormous statement. Another thing that I recall at one point, uh, way back when, going back to World War II, Christo's family, one of the members of his family, had owned a very successful chemical company. And apparently this was expropriated by the Nazis. And Christo undertook a long court case to get it back. It was an extremely valuable company. Uh, he won the case, he got it back, and then he gave it away. He didn't, he didn't want the money from it. He simply wanted justice and that it should not be improperly owned. But he, he didn't, even though it was very valuable, he didn't want the money from the actual company. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, w one reason... Principal guy. Yeah. One reason I, I admired him so much was this strong dedication to principles. Mm. And I see... Very ethical. Yeah. Yes. I see a lot of people in the world, and in art and politics and every field, uh, sort of being loose and shifty. And it's nothing you can look up to and, and admire. Now, I think Tina Segal actually does what he wants to do. So for me... That's okay. Um, I don't mind it. Uh, <laughs> and I find a lot of the ways that folks deal with these challenges, if they deal with it their way, it's admirable. I sometimes, you know, I, I think, geez, could I have done something differently? Should I have done something differently? And the answer is, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've often said, in fact, I very explicitly wrote it in a couple of essays, that if somebody had a really good memory, like the old uh, kind of people in Greece, the Iodos, the singer of songs, uh, who would memorize the entire Iliad and go from village to village singing the Iliad. Well, if you found somebody with a good enough memory, somebody could own my entire body of work. Now I've made instantiations that are, that are mine. They're unique. They take a physical form or I write a score or I do something and maybe I give it away or maybe somebody buys one, but whoever has it owns it, whether it's a gift or a purchase. But if somebody really wanted to own my work, all they'd have to do is memorize the scores and there it would be forever. That was my perhaps leads nicely into my other question, which is perhaps directed towards both of you. But um, uh, you used the, the term score, but then I think some of your works they kind of 
fluctuate between operating like a series of instructions that someone can actually do. And then, um, but then on the other end, they, they operate like, like a poem in the sense that they're a perfectly formed piece and you are communicating it as an idea. And once you've read it, you've essentially activated the piece. And uh, I guess um, uh, perhaps one of the reasons I thought about Phil is that I know you, for your performances, you've made quite beautiful graphic scores, um, many of which were on display in Wellington at City Gallery uh, recently. And um, I think those scores are both an expression of the piece, but they also perhaps operate as a kind of a series of instructions and help direct mm. musicians as to what they're supposed to do or performers. And um, I'm just, I guess I'm kind of curious about um, uh, how, to what degree a kind of a, a, a Cajun kind of model of score is, op is operating in each of your practices in the sense that um, uh, in some ways, once the score exists as text, um, it can exist entirely independently of both of you, but in various ways, both of you are inextricably entangled in those projects. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I'm just sort of curious about maybe um, if you could discuss that side of the projects from mm -hmm. each of your perspectives. Mm. Phil. Yeah, well, for my, um, yeah, for my, in my practice, I suppose, I have, I have two, two modes of operation. It depends to what extent you need to tell somebody what to do, how explicit you make the instructions or whether you know how oblique or how um, uh, uh, um, tangled. Um, I, yeah, I have two, two modes. One is like if I'm working often with a group where I actually, as I do in From Scratch, I need to provide quite specific instructions, then I, you know, I can write a score. If uh, I do my other more personal practice, uh, it's more of a visual music concept. So it's, uh, I don't expect anybody to have to realize it, but we do set up interpretations and um, then it's very open-ended. And uh, that's much more, it's much more in the spirit of Fluxus, perhaps, than, than the other, which is uh, more, more structured and more co conforms more to a, I mean, they're still within my own shorthand kind of mode and uh, my own kind of grammar, but um, they conform more to a, 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 more, a more conventional mode, I guess, or understanding of composition. No. Well, when you, when you were asking that, I almost was thinking that in some way, it's probably true of all music or all written things. Uh, once, the, once the score exists or once the text of a play exists, then it can be realized in many ways. I mean, once uh, Mozart has written Don Giovanni, then there it is. And everybody can do their Don Giovanni. Uh, some realizations are better, others are probably more feeble, but it's, it's Mozart's work and someone else's realization. Um, the same for, um, for Shakespeare, any Shakespeare play. In theory, I... Uh, I've often said, although I'm not necessarily, I'm not always happy with some realizations, but the truth is, it's always possible. Someone else might realize my work much better than I do. Um, you know, especially if, if I'm feeling too lackadaisical or, or haphazard, so I'm just being a bit careless, and then someone else does a perfect focused job, you know, their, their Ken Friedman will be better than my Ken Friedman. 